All right, welcome everybody. I'm Glenn Marks, collaborating with Robin Zander on responsive.org. I'm from the 180 circle. And welcome to another webinar, live interview. And today I'm delighted to include John Bunch from Zappos. For those of you who would like to ask questions, there should be a chat button on the bottom of your screen and you can type questions in and be happy to uh, ask John whatever comes up within the allotted time that we have. So, John, great to talk to you again. Can you just start off and talk a little bit about your background and your history with Zappos? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me and uh, looking forward to uh, engaging in a, a conversation with, with everybody here today. Um, yeah, my history at Zappos, um, I started, it's been, I'm coming up on 10 years at Zappos and uh, actually started as a software developer um, in 2009. Um, and uh, my, my journey at Zappos has been a little bit unique uh, and different. Uh, uh, I was kind of going up through the traditional job ladder uh, with software development. So I, you know, started managing a, a team um, and, uh, and that was going well. Um, and then one day in my inbox, I got an email uh, that said uh, that Tony, our CEO, Tony Shea, uh, was looking for an advisor. Uh, and so he defined an advisor as somebody to follow him day in and day out uh, for one year. Um, and uh, there was a lot going on at Zappos at the time. And so I thought this sounds like a really uh, interesting opportunity. So uh, applied for that role and was fortunate enough uh, to be selected uh, for that uh, role. And that kind of uh, took my career in a different direction. Um, and so, uh, you know, at that time at Zappos, a lot was going on. Um, we were in the midst of moving from uh, Henderson, uh, which is kind of suburban Las Vegas, to downtown Vegas. We had acquired the, um, acquired the uh, the old city, Las Vegas City Hall. Um, and so we were moving downtown. Um, we were also doing a lot of thinking about, we had grown from a small startup uh, to a 1500 person company. And there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of things where we felt like when we were still a small startup that we were able to change course and be really adaptable and responsive, um, but that we had lost that um, kind of as we had grown. Uh, the analogy we like to use is we had grown from a, or we had started as a speedboat, so a ship that could change course really quickly, uh, and we had grown to a cruise ship where, you know, cruise ship, there's a lot to like about cruise ships, there's lots of amenities, uh, and you're still making progress, you're still moving forward, but um, if you want to change course, it just takes a really long time. Let, let, me, inter let me interrupt you for a second, yeah. John. There's been a lot of questions and a lot of mystique around Zappos and for better or for worse, Zappos and Holacracy seem to be uh, embedded in a lot of people's thinking. Were you part of the transition to Holacracy or had that occurred before you started there? Yeah, uh, well, when I started, we had not moved uh, to Holacracy. In this period of time that I'm talking about, um, we were doing th a lot of thinking about how do we become more responsive and Holacracy was one of uh, the initiatives uh, that we explored uh, and ended up going full steam ahead with. Um, and that actually happened uh, during that period of time where I was Tony's advisor and I ended up uh, kind of being one of the key catalysts behind uh, that movement. Um, and so we did a small pilot with our HR group and then decided to uh, go full steam with the entire company. And, um, and so I helped to spin up a team and uh, for about a year and a half, that became my full-time work was uh, implementing and rolling out uh, Holacracy at Zappos. And that's helpful to, um, you know, other, other areas of focus and areas of work around the organizational design of Zappos. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was work that I took on. Excellent. So before we move into talking about how your position has evolved and some of the current work, uh, let's go back and kind of demystify and, and 
work through what some of the urban myths are around holacracy in, in Zappos and, and uh, have a few questions about your experience with that. Uh, before I dive into that, I, I just want to congratulate you. You are a living testament to all those software programmers and developers who may be going, am I in the right career? That there is life after software development. So kudos to you. Um, one of the questions that came up is, can you describe a little bit, you mentioned you did a pilot program, but what was the impetus for deciding to try Holacracy? It really just comes back to this uh, notion that, you know, as we had gone from a startup to a full-size company, uh, we had implemented traditional hierarchy uh, because, you know, I just think that's not what most companies do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, the, it's the model that is most familiar and that's just kind of what naturally happens unless a company determines that they don't want to do that. Um, and so I, I think we started to experience some pains that come with that kind of traditional hierarchical form that manifested in, uh, in this lack of agility. But also I think there was a sense like when we were a small startup that um, it was really fluid at Zappos and people would organize around like what, what work needed to happen. And like there was, there was people sensing and adapting to uh, what work needed to happen and organizing around that. And we kind of felt like as we grew and became siloed and people uh, had one, you know, had one manager and all their work reported up to that manager, we weren't really able to quickly uh, team around challenges or around opportunities uh, as effectively. And we felt like Holacracy was a, a tool as we learned more that we felt like we would be able to self-organize and really team around challenges and opportunities more quickly. Um, that was one of the things that drew, drew us to it. And the process of transitioning, how long did that take? Or is it still undergoing <laughs> transition? Yeah, I mean, definitely still undergoing. But the, the majority of the, uh, of the energy behind that spanned about a year. Really a year, we kind of did some prep up front. And uh, the goal was to get the entire company transitioned. Uh, over the course of the of a year, um, and so and that doesn't mean that like every person or every circle, as they're called in holacracy, uh, had gotten to mastery of the process at the end of that year. But at least that they were up and running, you know, kicked off, understood what it was all about, um, and could continue their learning journey. So, and give us an idea of the numbers. You talked about transitioning from a startup, which had how many employees? And then when you decided, okay, now you're actually a cruise liner. How many, <laughs> how many employees did you have then? And how many does Zappos have now? So it, we were about 1,500 at the time. Um, and we have about 1,500 now. So um, really, we've been uh, flat in terms of uh, employee uh, size base uh, over that time frame. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it was interesting. You know, I think one of the big changes was in the traditional system. We had about, um, about a hundred teams or so, 150 teams. Um, and after rolling out Holacracy, we still had about the same number of people at the organization. Uh, but we had, uh, about 450 circles. So the number of teams went up about threefold. Uh, whereas the number of individuals stayed uh, stayed flat. So obviously that shows that, you know, there's people teaming in different ways than they than they were before. Okay, and we're not going to go into the logistics of what circles are. For those who are not familiar with Holacracy, there is a previous recording uh, with Brian Robinson on the nature of Holacracy. There is a question and there's sort of, I don't know if this is truth or urban myth, that when Zappo... Okay transition to holacracy that there was a buyout for anybody that wasn't interested in working in this structure is that accurate uh yes there was a there was a an, a buy well a, a offer where it was i think one month uh worth of pay for every year uh that a person had been at the company with a minimum of three so if you'd only been there for one month you still got, or one year you still got three months uh, pay, 
uh, if you wanted to part ways. It wasn't just for Holacracy. I mean, we were also talking about uh, um, Frederick Laloux's reinventing organization. So the concept of a teal organization, uh, we kind of brought in. So it was actually internally called the teal offer. Um, uh, uh, but there was an offer around that time for people that, you know, there was a lot of change uh, in the organization, not really just about uh, Holacracy and Teal, but also about moving downtown. Um, and so there was an offer uh, for people that wanted to part ways. I don't remember the exact amount. I think it was around 10% of uh, Zaponians took that. Not, not all of those people were because of Holacracy or because right. of Teal. I mean, it was a it was a generous financial offer. I mean, for some people, it was a year's worth of pay to part ways and go do something else. And so, some people took it as an opportunity to start a business or whatever. Um, but uh, but yes, there was that offer, um, and uh, and uh, and you know, I think uh, it, I think at Zappos, we always want people here who are uh, committed to the organization aligned with the vision of where we're trying to get to and are really energized behind that vision. And there have been times throughout our organization where we've made similar offers. For instance, uh, we moved from uh, San Francisco to Las Vegas in the early days, and they did a very similar offer at that time. Uh, and you know, one of the things that's well known about Zappos is at the end of our new hire process, everybody gets an offer uh, to quit. Um, which is, you know, a little bit strange because, you know, we've invested a lot of time, money, and energy into recruiting uh, the right person, uh, and then we put them through a month-long new hire process, which is longer than most companies do, and then all of a sudden they get an offer to quit. That seems weird, but it all comes back to this. We want people here who are energized and aligned around where we're going as a company. And do you have any idea how many people take up that offer on quitting after they get onboarded? Um, I don't have the exact class. numbers. Uh, it's if there's a big class, I don't. I think it's maybe around one person if per class okay. of like 30, 40 people. Maybe maybe a little bit less than that. I don't have the exact numbers. Certainly not frequent, but it happens. And and I'm imagining, and, and this may or may not be in your circle, but I'm imagining that the people who analyze the data find it's actually a lot more cost effective to part ways before people get enmeshed into the culture and go, oops, this isn't really what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it creates a much better work environment. You know, I think both for the person, uh, you know, we want people here who are happy, energized to be here. Mm -hmm. And if for whatever reason that's not the case, like it's better for you and it's better for us if, you know, if right. uh, we decide to part ways, so. So I have a question from one of the participants about the process of switching to holacracy in terms of how did you onboard leaders and get them to relinquish the power that they had? Yeah. And, the, and sign off on just no longer being the hierarchical leader. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> at Zappos, I think even pre-holacracy, uh, there was a lot of onus put on individual autonomy um, and, uh, and authority. And so Holacracy helped further cement the system that directionally, I think we had already, uh, already espoused. And so, um, for those that don't know a lot, a lot about Holacracy, one of the tenants is distributed uh, authority. And so, um, putting authority, uh, for making decisions down to specific roles and, uh, relinquishing that from the lead link role or the leader role in Holacracy. And so I think it was already aligned with kind of how we thought about leadership at Zappos, but it put more of a system behind that. So, I mean, I, for each circle that got started, there was an education uh, and, a, um, and a process to help them get going with the process. So we had certified facilitators uh, on the Zappos side some that were full time in the holacracy circle, some that were had gone through our uh, our internal practitioner training, um, and we had about over, at the end of the process we had over a hundred sort of internal certified facilitators of the holacracy process, and those certified facilitators helped get circles kicked off, and they helped with ed education both of lead within those within those teams about what practicing Holacracy men and how to practice it, both from 
a leadership perspective and a role perspective. And so they were kind of a, a core uh, uh, um, way that we did that. We also held like lead link communities of practice. So times for lead links to come together to discuss, you know, the differences between the old system and holacracy. Um, so there were a lot of different ways that we uh, that we supported and offered educational opportunities for folks to to learn whether that person was a lead link or you know uh, not a lead link. All right. So there's a couple of questions that I'm going to weave together for you. And for those participating, uh, we will eventually move into where's some of the innovations that. Uh, Zappos uh, is engaged in currently, but there's a lot of curiosity about the process of holacracy. Um, there are two questions that come together. Is Zappos still fully embracing holacracy? And if the answer is no, what have been the benefits? What have you kept? And what have you decided to evolve to fit the needs of Zappos? Um, so is Zappos fully practicing holacracy? Yes, we are still operating fully under the holacracy constitution. <clears throat> I think the thing that's important to know is we've never had the holacracy police at Zappos. So what that means is that there's nobody checking up on every single circle saying, are you having your tactical meetings or your governance meetings? Are you capturing roles? Like there's no holacracy police where we go around and, and uh, make sure that the practice is at a super high level. So from an organizational standpoint, we still operate as a holacracy and you know we capture our roles, we capture our policies, everything is in the holacracy uh, process and lingo. Um, now the reality of the situation, I think if you look across the organization, there's different levels of practice. So if you look in one circle, it might be a super high functioning holacracy where if a holacracy expert came in, they would say, oh, this is a shining example of holacracy. And then in other circles, they're maybe doing the bare minimum needed to capture what they need to capture and they're not really fulfilling a lot of the, the high level practices. And, and so I think for us, you know, obviously I would like it if every group and every individual was a shining star of holacracy practice. But I think, you know, for us, it's always been about supporting people where they're at, um, helping, you know, helping them make the most out of the process and not also not, um, not being over, uh, over uh, enforcement of, you know, this is exactly how it has to be. So we do have some systematic things that ensure that certain elements of the holacracy practice are being followed. But for the most part, it's just kind of um, up to their their own uh, own way of going about things. And so how, if there is this independence and autonomy among teams, how do you keep all of the circles on the same page? In a pure holacracy format, there's a representative from each circle and, and other circles. Is that how you're keeping everybody on the same page? And how do you optimize execution of your strategy? Yeah, so I mean, we still have the rep link is what you're talking about. We still have rep links. It's captured in our system for how we capture uh, holacracy. You know, I think practically how that works, let's say there's a circle all the way down in some area that's not really practicing uh, at a high level. Um, you know, but somebody in that circle wants to make some change with a different area of the organization or maybe at the GCC our broadest circle like they have some idea of a new policy that they want to uh, initiate like that will have to happen through the holacracy process so even if they're even if at a base circle level there's not you know a high level of practice going like they they will encounter at some point some place where they're going to have to understand a little bit better uh, what that process looks like and engage with it. So, um, and, and we're there to help. Like if, if they're in a localized area where the practice is really at a, at a, you know, a basic level and they're trying to do something that's a little bit more complicated, like we're there to help them, uh, understand how, um, how to do that. So, so I want to come back to this. Uh, um, <laughs> want to, want to come back to this idea of 
in a traditional hierarchical company, the yeah. many of the goals are set at the top level, and then they get filtered down to the management system. And sure. you have your KPIs, and you have your bonuses, and you have your performance reviews. Um, since you have much more of a fluid kind of organic type structure, is there a process where the overarching goals filters down okay. and there's a, a way to hold teams accountable? How does that work? Yeah, well, that maybe gets a little bit more into where we've evolved to uh, since uh, implementing Holacracy, um, something you alluded to a little bit before. Um, one of the big initiatives that I'm currently work, working on is something called market-based dynamics or something internally we've dubbed market-based dynamics. Um, and the, uh, the thought process behind that is that we don't want to, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the things that research has found is that as companies grow, productivity per employee goes down. Mm -hmm. But as more dynamic systems grow, productivity per individual goes up. So um, there's a book called Triumph of the City where it talks about how as cities grow in size, productivity per uh, resident goes up. And so we want to model ourselves more on a dynamic, uh, complex, adaptive system and less on a traditional hierarchical form. And so that this market-based dynamics concept is one of the ways that we're looking at doing that. And so market-based dynamics said simply is each circle operates like its own micro business, micro enterprise. And so they're responding to market, uh, market feedback about um, so each circle has a, a, a service offerings um, and there are customers, whether those customers be internal or external, uh, that buy those service offerings. And so they're responding to what the market is saying needs to happen or what the market is saying uh, the opportunities are and dynamically doing that. It's not kind of a top-down set vision of what Zappos needs to be doing. It's a localized sensing and responding to, uh, to opportunities, that is how we think about that. I want to get into some more specifics about that. But before we do that, paint a picture for people participating on actually what Zappos does. It, it, it used to be a shoe company, but you have evolved and you provide a lot more than shoes at this point. Can you give us an overview of all the different uh, services and products, and then I want to come back and talk about examples of the specific circle, how they might operate, how they handle conflict, how they handle budgets, all of that. Sure. So yeah, Zappos. Um, you know, we started as uh, the as a shoe uh, e-commerce company that sold shoes, um, and you know, I think one of the early things that we thought about is we don't really just want to be a normal shoe company. We actually want to be a company that provides wow service. Um, so uh, if you've read Delivering Happiness, uh, Tony talks a lot about, um, about that. But we're, what we really want to be is a customer service company that just happens to sell blank. So we anchor around our customer service. Um, and what we would like to do is fill in as many blanks as we can. Um, uh, and so, you know, it started with shoes and certainly that is our, our, um, our most profitable and biggest business. Um, we diversified in other areas in the e-commerce sphere into things like clothes, um, and housewares and, uh, jewelry. <clears throat> um, and, uh, so we've diversified in that way. And then we started to diversify out into other areas. So, um, our, our second biggest business is one called Zappos Insights which provides um, uh, people who want to learn more about the Zappos culture um, and how we have created a, a company um, that really lives, breathes, and eats culture um, as a main driver for the organization. Uh, there's a group within Zappos that helps people come in and runs workshops and things like that, does speeches uh, on that. Um, and let, let, me, let me just stop and make sure I'm following something. So any other organization, whether they're using Holacracy, hook, line, and sinker or not, they look at Zappos and go, we want to do what they're doing. You have a service, you have a, a, a circle, so to speak, where people can come in and get training on the Zappos culture ethos processes. Yeah, yeah. So that's what 
focuses uh, really focuses on, and it's a it's a great um, you know I, there are a lot of people that are if you are at Zappos campus, there's people coming through every day, uh, you know, and it's great to in, engage with those types of people and for them to get to engage with us. So we're super happy about that. Okay. Um, yeah, but as as we look at uh, you know this concept of market based dynamics, we really want to encourage and help people fill in as many of those blanks as we can. Zappos is a customer service company that just happens to sell blank. Um, and so we're, we're starting, uh, we've created a lot of, you know, entrepreneurship programs and uh, trying to help make it easy for people to start businesses, uh, new lines of business coming out of Zappos. And we've seen some early, uh, early success stories uh, from that. And walk through a little bit because how the circles work within that. So let's just take this, the program you just described about training and offering, uh, bring other companies in to get an understanding. Is that in its entirely own circle with its own budget, its own rules for how to manage conflict, its own goal setting? How does that dovetail into the bigger company or does it? Yeah, so um, Zappos Insights is the name of that circle and they have their own uh, completely independent P&L. So they have a P&L where their customers are paying them for that service and they have their costs. Um, and all they have to, from, from a budgetary perspective, all they have to know is they have to balance their P and L um, on on a year on a yearly basis or even on a monthly basis. Um, and we have uh, we have mechanisms and methodologies for uh, each circle contributing profit to the overall company. Um, and so we've simplified it where each circle just has to break even uh, on their P and L. But yes, they have kind of their independent. Uh, circle and independent P&L, um, and they have a lot of autonomy within that. One way to think about kind of holacracy layered on top of that is that holacracy becomes kind of the, the city government for Zappos. So we have these independent small businesses operating in this ecosystem, but we still have ways of governing how, those, how the interactions between those independent units operates. Um, and Holacracy is our way of doing that. So let's say um, uh, Zappos Insights is operating as an independent group and something that they're doing is creating conflict with some other circle in the uh, mm -hmm. ecosystem. Um, how we would manage that is, well, first encourage a conversation and see if there's some way of working that conflict out without creating some sort of rule or process for that. But if it comes to a place where they're there's some sense that there needs to be a rule or process. We have Holacracy for making proposals uh, to do that. Um, and so Zappos Insights might create, a, create a, a proposal for a policy at our general company circle, which is the one that can help to, uh, can help to govern uh, the operations of the whole. Okay. In the culture, does that vary quite a bit from circle to circle? I mean, you. When I talk to you, you sound like you just are always on fire. You love what you're doing. <laughs> are you the exception or, or if I walked around in Zappos, is it a culture where everybody just constantly creating, exchanging ideas, customer focused? How do you keep that culture alive? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I've worked at a few other organizations and I can only speak for my own personal experience. Um, you know, from my own personal experience, it, it, you know, it is certainly a company where I always enjoy coming in every day to work. And I think, you know, most people that work at Zappos uh, really find deep connection between themselves and everything that's going on at Zappos, the culture. Um, it's certainly a place where one of our core values is embrace and drive change. And so there is a lot of change. Change is constant at Zappos, certainly at a higher level than, uh, than at you know, other places I've worked and I think the standard, um, but that kind of becomes the norm at Zappos. And so there's always a lot going on. Sometimes that can be challenging, you know, it's challenging to have a place where, you know, how it was yesterday is not necessarily how it's gonna be tomorrow. But, um, you know, I think we attract people who, uh, who really like that environment 
Um, and uh, you know, it, we create this fun, fun and weird place to come and work, and and uh, and it really is a place where when you walk around, there's um, there's a really a sense of excitement that doesn't uh, wane. It it kind of helps to self perpetuate. I've also heard you make some comments about the, where Zappos is very unique, or at least from companies I'm familiar with, about some of your long range planning. Did I hear you once say you have like a hundred year plan or something like that, or am I making that up? Even longer. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the purpose of a circle that I'm involved in called evolutionary organization is uh, to help Zappos be around in a thousand years. And so um, we're doing a lot of thinking and a lot of research around uh, what makes organizations uh, anti-fragile um, uh, and, and which is, a step beyond resiliency, um, where you actually get better as uh, uh, as tensions or opportunities get filtered into the system. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking at work uh, like that from Martin Reeves, uh, the biology of corporate survival, um, to look at how we can create a company that does, that is around in a thousand years. And we're looking at how do we bring those practices and principles into the organization, into Zappos. Um, and market-based dynamics is one of the things, uh, one of our current initiatives to help us uh, become more anti-fragile as an organization. So there are at least two components of that. And, and one is your, and, and I'll ask you some questions about the, the, the um, market-based strategies. And then there is the people part of it. And constantly making sure people are developing the resilience, keeping a, a healthy culture. Are those addressed separately? Do you have a bunch of coaches on staff? Do people, how, how, how do people build that connection and that resilience within the teams and the circles? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that we've been talking a lot about uh, recently at Zappos is something we call the triangle of accountability. And so our, our idea is that no matter what it is, as long as it falls into three components, uh, we that is something that we want to pursue. Um, and so the baseline is our company culture and core values. So everything that we do at Zappos needs to fall in line with our company uh, core values. Second component is uh, wow customer service. So um, in anything that we do, we want to differentiate ourselves on giving the absolute best customer service in whatever that is. And then the third component is this financial sustainability piece where each circle uh, or everything that we do needs to have a balanced p and um, uh, balanced independent P&L. So we do a lot of coaching on, uh, on how those three things overlap and making sure that everybody understands how to pursue ideas uh, within those three constraints within those three constructs. So for instance, um, we give training on a customer focused mindset, how to do things in a way where you're keeping customer focus as the top, as one of your top priorities. And that doesn't matter whether it's internal or external. We look at internal uh, people as our customers as well. So if you're doing something and the value that you're creating is internal, how do you how do you think about that person or that circle as your customer? So we do training around that. There are people that focus around training around culture and core values. And there's other initiatives that focus around, you know, that financial sustainability piece or, you know, the entrepreneurial mindset that might need to come behind uh, businesses operating in that, that way. But we focus on all three sides of that triangle of accountability. Are there specific tools, apps, software protocols that uh, help keep the operations all within this triangle you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of this, we're uh, kind of, uh, uh, we are the, one of the only organizations that we've seen that are looking to operate in this way. I think it's something we're hoping uh, has a lot of success and over time other organizations uh, see the benefits of. Um, but we're building a lot of our own tools in the house to help us uh, run and operate in this way. So like for the financial sustainability piece, we have a tool called the CFO tool, 
uh, which helps us, uh, which helps have uh, each circle have its own DNL. Uh, it does things like uh, circles can create service agreements between one circle and another circle, um, and it helps circles uh, create invoices with customers outside of Zappo. So anything related to that financial piece, we have a tool called the CFO tool that helps us to, to operate that. Um, we have other tools that we built. So we have a tool called Huzzah, which helps us uh, do our internal org structure. Um, and we have other tools for things like, how do you give difficult feedback from one person to another? There are tools that help, uh, help to uh, coach people on that as well. So yes, we've got a bunch of in-house tools that, um, that help on all three sides of those, that triangle of accountability. In following up on the software you're developing, the market-based uh, strategies, I presume these are constant evolutionary processes. Yes. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna name one of my pet peeves, which it sounds like you, you your company is ahead of the circle, which is how many times I'm being serviced at some healthcare organization or some large global retailer and the person I'm interacting with spends a disproportionate amount of time looking at a computer screen. Do you, are these things that come up when you're talking, I and mean, when you talk about wow customer service, that has to be a factor. So where are you getting your feedback? Where are you getting your information that your system needs to be tweaked? It's great, it's ready to go to market. How does all that work? Um, yeah, I mean, well, I think we have, I'll talk about kind of our e-commerce business and then the rest. Okay. So our e-commerce side, which is still a vast majority of our business, um, you know, there's, there are teams that focus specifically on uh, creating tools uh, that, uh, that really make that customer interaction, however it happens, whether it's, you know, calling on the phone or a live chat or whatever, making that customer interaction as good as it can be and getting good feedback about how we're doing with that. So there are teams specifically focused around that challenge. Um, as it comes to internal or, or other, just the rest, um, you know, I think we're building these tools. Um, and so we uh, create ways of people giving us feedback around those tools specifically, um, whether that be, you know, links down at the bottom of the tool or, uh, surveys that go out about, you know, how, how are you feeling about not, maybe not just the tools, but the overall systems and thought processes. Um, so uh, we have surveys around that. Um, and then one of the other bits that were uh, just as far as it comes to uh, that customer focused mindset and that being applied internally, um, we have, uh, you know, uh, ways for people to give feedback directly to uh, to people that are servicing them about how well they're servicing them. So like customer satisfaction scores. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the exciting bits is that in traditional organizations, those relationships are not, um, are not super uh, defined. So, you know, one group may be servicing a lot of different other groups, but there's no direct service agreement or no direct line of this group is servicing these people and that, Often, I, you know, I think one of the things I'm excited about is that we are making that more uh, defined and that will help those people who are being serviced give good feedback to the servicers or give good customer satisfaction scores to the servicers, which just creates this more open, transparent flow of information. Um, because, you know, at Zappos, I think I can truly say that every circle really wants to be as best as they can be and do, you know, uh, do as well as they can. And so any way that we can increase the amount of communication and feedback, uh, we would love to do that. And we're, we're aligning our tools um, around that as well. Excellent. And in terms of, uh, let's go to the e-commerce, the decisions about what type of products to add, the decisions to go beyond shoes. Um, is that stem from a lot of market research? Is that you have some employees that go, oh, this is cool. Let's go into the blank business. How does that all work? Yeah, I mean, and, and so that's part of, that's another part of maybe an, an initiative that within market-based dynamics, we're looking to explore. Um, you know, when a traditional e-commerce company, the way that it happens is there are buyers 
that are specifically focused around one specific, whether it's a brand or a customer segment or whatever, but there's one buyer that is, uh, you know, that is specifically there to buy that one brand or that one product. You know, I think we're exploring avenues where it, de it, it opens the doors, where if you as a Zappos employee uh, have an idea of getting into a product category or brand or a style that we're not currently into, that we're not currently in, like you should be able to invest in that um, and create your own, uh, you know, make your own buying decisions and be judged based on the, uh, based on the, uh, whether that, you know, sells really effectively or not. Um, but just kind of decentralize it or, or, um, giving the ability for people, uh, to, uh, make their own buying decisions about products, even within the e-commerce sphere. Let me switch gears for just a moment and, and talk about compensation. There's a lot of models out there. How does Zappos determine profit sharing, meritocracy, predetermined wages plus bonuses? How are people compensated? Yeah. So I think this for us is an example of we don't have to make all the changes overnight. Like we want to be strategic about how we think about things, uh, getting towards our long-term vision. And so currently uh, at Zappos, compensation is done in a very traditional way um, where uh, we have a compensation committee and uh, that compensation committee uh, looks at employees and the work that they're doing and uh, looks at the skills and the market price for the skills that they're doing and determines compensation in that way. So if you're a software developer, um, the compensation committee looks at what you're doing, develops you know a model or fits it into an existing model and then compensates you based on that. If you grow your skills in that area, um, you know they, they'll look at that and, and compensate accordingly. Um, I think one of the things that as we shifted to holacracy opened up is that it enables people to not be fall nicely, neatly into a pre-existing job profile. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm not just a soft, well, look at me. I'm not just a software developer. I'm doing organizational design and, you know, um, and so how do you, um, so that puts just a, an additional bit of stress around that, that question of what work are you doing and what's the appropriate compensation for that? So that's kind of one of the things. And, and that's one of the, the things that the comp group has looked at is how to create blended profiles across uh, different job families. Um, but then the, the other bit, as we kind of think about this principle of, you know, each circle being like a micro enterprise, um, we also want to uh, look at ways that we can give more autonomy for those micro enterprises to set their own compensation in ways that make sense for them. Um, um, within as long as, so going back to the triangle of accountability, like each circle is judged on a PL and l and they need to make uh, decisions that are financially sustainable. But as long as they're making decisions that are financially sustainable, giving them more autonomy of how they decide to comp within their group and, and how all that works. And you might be a member of multiple different circles. So your comp might be, uh, might be a blended model from a little bit from this circle, a little bit from that circle. So that's something we're looking into, but we haven't, um, we're, we're piloting or, or thinking about some processes to, to go with that. But right now we're more in a traditional uh, comp committee setting comp based on the skills uh, that a group is doing, that an individual is doing. And another very sort of tangential question and I will be introducing someone in a future webinar talking about the level of anxiety and emotional well-being in the tech industry, the fact it changes so quickly, the fact that people constantly need to keep up. Do you monitor that? Do you take surveys on customer well-being? Is it, I'm not customer, I'm sorry, employee well-being. Is there any reason to believe that people are happier and emotionally healthier at Zappos than the blank company out there? Yeah, 
I mean, I think just like a lot of companies today, we have employee uh, sentiment surveys that monitor the progress of, you know, how employees are feeling about uh, a wide range of things, everything from culture to uh, emotional well-being. And so th those are things that we try to monitor. You know, I think we also have programs that speak to, uh, speak to that. We have, for instance, life coaches uh, uh, on staff um, that um, if there are people that need support, um, that they have that as an internal resource. We also partner with uh, external vendors that uh, specialize in some of those areas to, to, to give opportunities to. So it's something that we're certainly not blind to and we do everything in our power uh, to support uh, people with that. Um, uh, so yeah, we definitely, definitely try to do what we can with that. And am I correct that Zappos has a nonprofit foundation? We have, yeah, we have a, a, a group that focuses on, uh, focuses on charity. Um, I don't know the specifics on like the exact dollar figures, but uh, certainly if you come to Las Vegas, you will see lots of, uh, lots of engagements with uh, Zappos and uh, external uh, entities that are, that are uh, not for profit. So for instance, we have a, we have a, uh, you know, a Thanksgiving. We have a lot of people on on campus giving out meals and so forth. Or we have uh, engagements with um, uh, like prom closet where people come on campus and get you know uh, things for their prom. Um, uh, and so we also uh, have uh, uh, host a prom for uh, special needs uh, folks. And so it really you know, runs the gamut, but we do have a lot of different initiatives with the community. So you're going to have an uptick in people applying for jobs after this <laughs> interview. We hope. we hope. Sounds like a, really an extraordinary uh, organization. So John, you will be on the main stage at the responsive conference, which is being hosted at Zappos headquarter. Another example of Zappos generosity and, and inclusion. Um, you'll be continuing this conversation about some of the evolution of Zappos. For those who are interested, that will be September, and I think I have the dates right, 11th and 12th. It's either the 11th or 12th or 12th and 13th. Uh, for more information, you can go to responsiveconference.com. For more information about some of the work in the responsive community, you can go to responsive dot org to find out more about my work coaching and consulting with the high performing teams and to catch recordings of previous interviews uh, as mentioned earlier there's a recording of um brian robertson of holacracy you can go to 180 circle.com this john if people want to get a hold of you is, is uh, are you publicly available or <laughs> Yeah, I am publicly available. Probably the best way is uh, LinkedIn. Uh, just, you know, add me on LinkedIn and, and uh, ask a question. I'm not super active. Uh, I, I can't promise a one day response time, but uh, uh, go through there every once in a while. Um, so that's probably the best way. Okay. So final uh, set of questions for you. In, from your vantage point, what do you see as some of the most exciting trends, both in Zappos and the future of the workplace in the next five to 10 years? And the flip side of that question is, what do you see as some of your biggest concerns about the future of work in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I think through technology, there will be a, an increased ability for uh, for work to be more agile, adaptable, nimble, and um, and non-traditional, you know, not having to pigeonhole uh, work into a certain thing, um, and so I'm excited to see uh, see the evolution of that um, and creating really workplaces where work change and shifts and adjusts to meet opportunity spaces and customer needs. Um, I think that that will happen. Uh, you know, increasingly as we, uh, as time goes on. And so I'm excited to see that. I'm excited to uh, hopefully at Zappos be a model for, uh, for how that can work. 
um, a model that we can share with other organizations who might be similarly uh, inclined. Um, and so uh, excited to see that and see how technology uh, enables that um, uh, over time. And anything on the horizon that concerns you? Any trends that you would like to be able to intercept and move in a different direction? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe just piggybacking on that, which I'm excited about. Uh, you know, I think going to your point about uh, psych psychological safety or, um, or uh, people being energized by that, like, I think that there is this challenge as we think about uh, more responsive or adaptive organizations. There's also the challenge where people, um, many people, not all people, but many people really uh, feel more comfortable in things that are stable and not, you know, ever changing and ever moving. And so there's this, uh, there's this uh, challenge of, I think more and more organizations will be uh, adaptable and changing. And yet there's this challenge of, how do how do people uh, feel about that, and how do they how do they uh, feel stable in such an environment? Um, and so that's a challenge that I you know we've definitely uh, grappled with and are working on at Zappos. And I think regardless of everything we're doing at Zappos, I think is a challenge for the broader uh, workplace uh, community. Whether even if you're in a very traditional sense, I think the pace of change will be increasing, and that has. Uh, impacts on the employee experience, and I think that's something that uh, people will need to need to think on and and try to support. And that's the perfect segue into my introduction to the next responsive interview. Will be the twenty second of August um, with uh, Rajkumari Nyoji, and we're going to be talking specifically about that point about. Uh, wellness and emotional well-being in the workplace. Uh, John, you will um, continue to be inspiring people, and I appreciate your generosity, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. All right. Thanks, Glenn. Bye-bye. Take care.